So uh, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. So um, it's my pleasure to be joined by, by Dr. Chris Hanna tonight. He uh, is going to be talking to us about the hip and groin, um, which is a, an area of special interest for him. Um, we haven't done a webinar for a couple of weeks, but uh, we're now committed to doing those once a week. And we think that uh, based on the feedback that we've gotten, uh, Wednesday is probably the night. So um, keep an eye out for those. I am gonna post a poll in a minute, uh, just about some possible topics for next week. So uh, feel free to answer the poll um, and uh, that will help guide what we're gonna do next. So we've got a few ideas about uh, both some national and international speakers. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I hope that you're all going well out in the telehealth uh, environment um, and that it's not treating you too badly. Um, just a couple of things to remember. We're going to have a, a talk. Chris has got a PowerPoint which he'll share with us. Um, but we are then going to break off and uh, he's going to do some examining of me, which uh, I'm sure will be a highlight for everyone. Um, so just during that, if you have a look up the top right, you'll see speak of you. So if you want to uh, just watch Chris, um, remember to click on speak of you. If you want to see us both and uh, what he's doing with the examination, make sure that you click on that and you'll see gallery view. So that would be uh, one thing to look out for. Um, the second is around the, the chat button and the polling button. So if you want to uh, ask a question, which I'd really encourage you to do, we want these to be as interactive as we possibly can make them. Um, make sure uh, you click on the, the polling button uh, or, the, or ideally actually the Q&A button. So um, I can manage that for Chris. We've got a few questions. So thanks for your, those, uh, those of you who've emailed them in, in advance um, and we'll try and get to those as we go. So. Um, it's enough talking from me, so I'm going to hand over to Chris. Uh, so welcome, Chris Hanna. Um, and Chris, uh, we're looking forward to hearing about how you examine the hip and groin, um, particularly with a view to telehealth, um, and also, uh, I guess, a little bit about your thinking about the assessment and treatment of groin pain in general. So um, over to you. Brilliant. Well, thanks for the introduction, Mark, and thanks, everyone, for tuning up tonight. Um, it's been a bit of a different world to live in over the last few weeks for us. And uh, I've had a little bit of experience now doing telehealth assessments of hips and groins. And so I'm going to share some of my experience um, tonight, but also we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the research that's around. Uh, so these are the topics that I'm going to cover and we're going to start looking at research and regulations. The first paper, which Mark's got a link to uh, that he put me on to actually was from a group in Duke University where they wanted to see how well they could assess hips and groins in a telehealth environment. They were hip specialists. Uh, so patients referred in for assessment by a hip surgeon actually and 75 of them were put through this process where they were either led through a self-administered exam in a mock telehealth environment where they did all the testing on themselves uh, or they had an examination by a physician and if they did themselves first, the physician did the same exams on them second and they swapped around, ran, they were randomised into who did what first. Now the striking thing about that study was that if you look at this table here, you can see that the self-administered exam was statistically significantly better than if the clinician examined the patient. Um, but one thing I'd like you to notice is that that confidence interval for the physician doesn't cross the 50% line. And what that tells me is that if you're standing outside wondering whether you should go in, if you take a coin out of your pocket and flip it, you'll have a better idea than if you walk through the door and let the physician examine you. So I think there's something a little bit off um, with the environment or the way they've done those tests, or maybe their definition of, they were actually testing for femoroacetabular impingement with that. But it's, what they have done is they've identified a range of tests that they can apply in a telehealth setting and also identified some of them that were particularly good and we'll talk a bit about that when we get to the examination section. Just in terms of the regulations, uh, medical councils had guidelines for about four or five years now. A consultation or an assessment is uh, any time when you are meeting with a patient for the purpose of using your diagnostic or therapeutic knowledge to help them and so if you are uh, claiming that as, as a consultation, you need to be documenting it as a, as a consultation and appropriate communication with the patient and any other primary care providers is really important. The legislation in New Zealand says that if you can't provide the same standard of care as in person, you need to inform the patient and get their consent. And uh, we have a standard phrase on our letter that documents that this has been carried out in a telehealth environment. And I'd suggest everybody does that. ACC's legislation, which has been updated recently, says that a treatment that's claimed on telehealth needs to be both necessary and appropriate. 
So if you're just ringing the patient up and saying, hey, how you doing? That may not be fulfilling that, but if you have planned to follow them up at two weeks time and you're contacting them to make sure they're doing the exercise and documenting their pro progress, then I'd say that probably is necessary and appropriate. One other thing, if you haven't met this patient before, so if you are seeing a new patient, it really is important to identify them. You are responsible for that information, so you need to check when you talk to them their name, and I would suggest getting their date of birth at the same time. So the other thing that I've learned with telehealth, and I'm sure most of you have had episodes of this as well, is that it's not 100% reliable, and we have to learn a little bit on the fly, and so I thought I'd give you my insight into things that work and things you need to know. And the first thing is that Ethernet, which is when you plug a cable into your computer, is way faster than Wi-Fi, no matter how hard you try. Ethernet's what comes in off the street. It could be broadband or fiber, um, but Wi-Fi slows it down significantly. So if you're working from home and you're on the Wi-Fi and you're a bit frustrated with how things are going, if you can get a plug and a cable and plug it into the router, you may find it's more reliable and it's definitely faster. Um, sometimes though, your internet server may go down and my internet server had a bit of a glitch in the first week of uh, the lockdown. And so one afternoon there was no service for a few of us and I was able to finish off my afternoon using my mobile phone, using my data and uh, using it as a hotspot to my laptop. So there's, there's a backup plan if the internet uh, goes down as well. But sometimes you can have issues with your hardware. There might be a compatibility issue. Sometimes it's a software issue and sometimes it's what the geeks call a wetware issue or a PEBCAP problem. That's a, the problem exists between keyboard and computer. Um, and so I've had occasions where the Doxy Me site won't allow me to communicate with someone for whatever reason. And then you're left looking for a backup. And the simplest is to pick your phone up and ring the patient. Uh, but you're not gonna have the advantage of video um, to examine them with if you do that. And so if it's your first consultation or you want to document progress and range of motion or strength or function, and you want that video, then you need to look for some alternative. Now our legislation in New Zealand says that whatever platform you use needs to be secure. And I can't vouch for anything other than medical bases like DoxyMe. Um, so none of the rest of these are definitively secure, but they are alternatives to use in a pinch. So if you're really fast at sorting out Zoom like Fulcher's, you can use that. Um, what I do is on Doxy, I can tell that the patient's using iOS. So when I ring them, I know that they've got an iPhone or an iPad and I might offer them FaceTime. The problem with that is that they get my phone number and I've had a patient ring me a couple of times saying, who can I get a work certificate from? And it's the middle of the day, why aren't you doing it sort of thing. Um, Skype, no problem. You can set up a, a, a work account for that. Viber and Messenger both have video capabilities. So there are options if the patient has nothing else, but they do have Viber or they do have Messenger. Again, you're giving up personal information. Same with WhatsApp. WhatsApp is something that you can get around. There's an app called Text Free. And if you download that, that acts as a text sender and receiver over the internet. So you can register a WhatsApp uh, account with Text Free and then have a, a phone that's not giving away your personal phone number. It may not be an issue for some of you, but obviously if uh, it is, then there are ways around it. So that was just quickly whipping through those. Now we're into the real uh, sandwich that we're here for. And this, the problem solving starts with the history. Um, you know, colleagues of mine tell me that 80% of the time you have the answer from the history alone. And so taking a good history is where it all starts. And I always ask these 12 questions for Every patient I see, well, I always wanna know when the problem actually started. And sometimes people will say, oh, it's been going on forever. Well, what is forever? When did it actually start? Did you have it when you were five? Did you have it when you were 15? Or did it happen with that particular event? And what, what happened? What was the mechanism of injury? Where is the pain? Where has it been? Does it refer anywhere else? It's character, it's intensity. I don't wanna teach you how to suck eggs, but this, these are the questions I ask. Diurnal variation, night pain, morning stiffness, inflammatory pain, which is, Worse when you've stiffened up and better when you get up and moving. Mechanical pain, which gets worse the more you do. Neural pain can be either or both and has an element of burning to it usually. What sort of things make it worse? What makes it better? And then with the hip and groin associated symptoms like locking or clunking or people say my hip pops out. Do you have any of that? Uh, and sometimes nerve symptoms can be a part of that as well. And then the other stuff that's quite important is what kind of treatment have you tried and how did you get on with those different treatments? Did something work better than something else. But just well, on the, take, sorry. We do have a question here. 
uh, which is about what classic signs are your symptoms I'm probably thinking about more would make you suspicious of a hip infection or a possible tumor yeah so basically these are these are really important things so when you're thinking about a problem you want to think what's the most likely thing and then you also want to think and what are the things I don't want to miss and you don't want to be missing a tumor and you don't want to be missing a septic arthritis the thing with a septic arthritis is that it can cause permanent joint surface loss within eight hours so if if you are suspicious you need to be uh, dealing with that promptly not waiting and seeing so the, the thing that would tell you it's a septic arthritis is that the patient is extremely sore so the hip doesn't want to move at all in a septic arthritis they're often unwell they often feel off their food they may not have fevers and sweats but usually they do and sometimes they'll say oh i think i've got coronavirus and i've sprained my hip um, so i've had a patient come in and say look i've got the flu but i've hurt my hip and they actually had an infection and it was it wasn't he hadn't caught the flu from his wife he actually had a, a sepsis and had to be admitted that night so those would be the clues that it's an infection. A tumor is normally the, the warning signs that you'll get are it can be pain related. So unrelenting or uncharacteristic pain or night pain that's not related to what you've done through the day. In fact, any pain that's not related to load would, would raise your possibility. Um, systemic things like weight loss would be another red flag. But anyone with a history of cancer you have to assume they've got cancer again when you're trying to work out what's going on. So that's one of my red flags for, for these patients is someone who's had a past history of any kind of cancer. So someone might say, oh, I had melanoma, but it was excised 20 years ago. Well, I'm thinking that's just about long enough to have a bone metastasis that's starting to cause pain. So um, just that, those would be the background things that you'd be thinking about. Um, what I was just going to say is that the patient's age can influence the likely thing. So people who are really young, like under the age of 10, are more likely to have perthes or irritable hip. And those are both what we call diagnoses of exclusion. You have to know they're not those things before you can, you have to know it's not an infection, you have to know it's not a, a growth plate injury um, before you make that label of ir irritable hip. So for me, that would be investigation or admission. Then while you're still young, but you're getting close to closing your growths, um, the risk of a slip femoral epiphysis is getting up there. So we're talking about early teens who are going through a growth plate, a growth spurt. Sometimes they're a little obese and that's what you'd see in the public system. But in sports medicine, we see the kids who are playing rep football and school football and club football and playing futsal on the evenings that are not playing football. And so, you know, they're just pounding those growth plates and they're not getting the chance to adapt. So they're the ones who get into trouble. As you get older, you sort of sort that stuff out, but you can run into trouble with stress fractures. Sorry, I'm just uh, a little distracted by the, the pole that's in front of me here. Um, in late teens, 20s, we get into the stress fracture realm. But normally people have sorted their heads out by the time they get into the 30s and stress fractures aren't quite so common there. They get common again a little later on, but more insufficiency fractures with changes in bone density. Well, I mean, it's because we're going through our midlife crisis and we're trying to run that marathon or do that half Ironman or Ironman um, a little too fast. In our 30s, um, wheel alignment issues like mild acetabular dysplasia or a cam lesion causing femoroacetabular impingement can start to become symptomatic. So that's the common age group. It can present earlier if it's a bigger deal uh, and it can present later if it's not so bad, but that's the time frame that I'd be thinking of. And then when you get to around my age, the early osteoarthritis can start, it can start earlier than this and someone with a hereditary uh, primary osteoarthritis, but it's, that's the sort of age group you're starting to think about. And then as we get older, the insufficiency fractures, the gluteal tendinopathies and, and people with quite severe hip pain and underlying osteoarthritis are uh, possibly presenting with avascular necrosis of the femoral head. So another one just to keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at that patient. What sport they play can direct you. So I did a review of patients a little while ago and 90% of people presenting were football players and 90% of football players were presenting with groin pain. Uh, I think that's changed a bit now. I'm seeing a lot more of a mixed crowd so it's probably worth having another look at that another group to think about are these um, groups here martial arts ballet and gymnastics so when i'm talking to patients about fai and labral tears i tell them there are three ways of getting a labral tear 
One is to have an abnormal acetabulum. A cup that's too shallow will cause your ball to slide out. A cup that's too deep will cause more impingement. Another way is to have an abnormal ball. So if you've got a real cam deformity, then you're going to engage the edge more commonly and that's going to cause damage. And the third thing is to do abnormal things with a normal joint. And that's why those three are the three I just sort of spit out. But if someone's doing cheerleading or any other reason to be getting into splits positions, they're going to be higher on my list of uh, thinking about the labrum. And then if someone's only job is running and uh, or their only stress relief or their only therapy is running and they've got running related pain, then you've got to think about stress fracture. And the reason we care about that more in the hip than a lot of other places, I mean, the foot's pretty serious as well, is that the femoral neck stress fractures can be an issue. They're mostly compression sided, so they mostly do well. If they complete though, 30% of people who get a complete fracture of the neck of femur get a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. And in a you know, 25 year old female who needs to have a joint replacement to have a functioning joint, that's a lifelong sentence to a, a change in load. So picking them up early and treating them promptly is the key there. And that brings us through to examination. And just before I get Mark to um, change his backdrop there, I just want to have a quick chat about some things you have to think about. So when I'm sort of at first talking to a patient, I'm having a look around what's behind them. Uh, so I want to know if they've got room to move. Is there a space here where they can walk and step and squat and then sit on a chair and lie down? I want them to get a chair. Another thing is who's at the house. Is there someone in the background like their younger brother they might not want around? So I'd be sort of trying to facilitate asking that person to move off or a mum or a dad who they might want to have in the room, um, you know, give them an opportunity to get them in. They need to be dressed appropriately. And we've had some interesting uh, um, telehealth consultations with patients. I haven't had anything out of the ordinary, but, you know, people having their consultation lying in bed in their pajamas and things like that. But, you know, for an examination like this, you don't really want a pair of baggy boxer shorts. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of Lycra in my clinic. I like to be able to test sensation, uh, but in the patient's home, I'm not gonna to be touching them anyway, so I don't mind Lycra. They can move in that and be comfortable, but shorts are pretty good. Oh, yeah, thing, sorry? Yeah, personal preference for Lycra, but uh, no. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't mind Lycra myself, but um, those uh, yoga pants are the key. So when you're examining young women, if you're a guy, you might also want to take the opportunity to ask about a chaperone like his mum there. You might not say, hey, do you want a chaperone? You might say, well, what I say is, I don't suppose mum or dad's around. Do they want to come and listen to this? Uh, it might be good to have someone who can hold the camera for us because there's no doubt the best way to manage the camera is if someone's holding it because they can have it pointing at you and see what's on the screen, whereas the individual patient will have to put the camera somewhere and move and they'll be worried about what you can see and it does get a little distracting. So having it, someone help is actually a useful thing anyway. Laptops are way better than phones because you can tilt the screen down and it can be up on the table and you can see the whole person. It gives you a much better perspective. Phones are hard to lean forward without them falling over. You can try propping them up in a mug if they've got a big enough mug and a small enough phone that gives you a good angle. Um, but most of the time they're gonna be put down on the floor and propped up so they're pointing slightly upwards to let us see the whole patient. And then the last thing is I have had a couple of patients sitting right in front of the windows and you know, you're know you trying to see them. It's just annoying, get them to close the curtain and you get a totally different uh, picture. Don't be shy asking them to close the curtain. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we'll switch over to this uh, speaker view, gallery view thing. Um, if you, I'm gonna get Mark to uh, change his backdrop there and uh, what I normally like is I like to be able to see the abs. So I, I like a pair of shorts, I like to see the thighs, and I like to be able to see the abs. In a, in a perfect world, I'd have the shorts on and the shirt off. Um, young ladies obviously tuck the shirt into a bra or something like that. So what are you wearing, Mark? A hoodie. A hoodie, okay. Can I get you to stand up and step back from the computer so we can get you all in? You might wanna take that chair back because we're gonna need it in a second. Good stuff. All right, so I want you to hitch your hoodie up so I can see your abs. I want it up to the bottom of your rib cage. That's pretty good. So we're just getting a look at, at what's going on here, a symmetry of those um, muscles on the side of the abs there. Nice hoodie, by the way, should have pointed that out. And so 
you, you know, get the patient to tuck that shirt up if they can and just put your hands on your hips now. And the reason I get patients to put their hands on their hips is they know where those bones are. It's hard to see them from this far, but you can see where those hands are. You're looking for leg length discrepancy or any asymmetry, asymmetry in shoulder height, any little clue that there's something a little off here. So hands on the hips gives you that. And then I'm going to just get you to turn to your right by 90 degrees so you side onto the camera. And obviously hip and groin pain can come from the back, can come from the sacroiliate joint. And so you can't just examine the hips. So we're going to do a little bit of back stuff. Keeping your legs straight, I want you to run your hands down the front of your thighs and try and touch your toes. And we're just looking at how well he goes down there, much better than me, and come back up again. Any discomfort at all doing that, Mark. And then hands on your hips and arch your back back as far as you can go. And pretty good range. And no pain in the hip or groin with that. Standing up, turn to the right again by 90 degrees so you're facing away from the camera. I just want you to run your hands down the front of your thighs again and touch your toes one more time. This time, what we're looking at is whether there's any scoliosis coming back up again for me, Mark. Um, this is a good position to look for wasting of the hamstring. So if they've got hamstring pain or they've had a snap or a tear, get them to pull their shorts up as they do that. Can you turn to the right one more time for me? And this time we're just looking at his relaxed posture. It's the time to remember what's his lordosis doing, where's his head position, is there a hip fix, flicks, flexion deformity or knee hyperextension and then turning back to the front and I'll just get you to take your right hand and run it straight down your side as far as you can comfortably get any pain with that no come back up and down to the other side that's great so obviously we're looking for any asymmetry in movement but we're also looking to see if we can reproduce the the patient's pain with that okay so I just want you to walk away from the camera to the couch so sometimes I'll get them to walk towards the camera, turn around and walk right up to the camera for me. We're just looking at that symmetry of movement. Turn around and walk back onto your mat for me. Is there any significant sway to one side, any shift, any Trendelenburg at that gate and back to facing me? If you put your feet together and roll your ankles out as wide as you can get them to go, we're looking at that subtalar movement. Could be too much, could be too little, and then feet wider than your hips apart and squeeze your knees together, roll those ankles in. And again, really nice movement there. So back to the middle. So Mark, no sign of a coalition, no subtalar stiffness, no biomechanical issue that's going to be throwing an effect up that kinetic chain. So with your feet about hip width apart, keeping your heels on the floor, I just want you to squat as low as you can comfortably get. That's really good. So this is a real good little screen for a bunch of things. It's for hip impingement, it's for anterior knee pain, it's for ankle dorsiflexion impingement or calf tightness. You see a whole lot with that. If you come up onto your toes this time and come down into a squat, keeping those heels off the ground, show me how you go with that. And this is really pushing those hips a lot further into flexion and back up again. And if you want to, you can get them to do a little duck walk at the bottom. So drop on down. This guy's a tuned athlete. Look at that, effortless, and back up again. Perfect. So now what I'm going to get you to do is just try balancing on your right leg for me. And I just want you to do three little short knee bends, dropping that knee in front of your toes and back up again. So again, hands on the hips are nice because you can see if there's a drop. It's harder to tell when they're not there. You're looking for that pelvis, the knee alignment, whether he's got good proprioception. Some people, you can tell before they even start that they've lost their proprioception on that side. And show me the same on the other side. All right, that's good. Now what I want you to do is just, we'll stop you there. With your hands on your hips, I just want you to balance back on your right leg and just lift that left hip higher. So that's exactly right. So that left hand goes higher than the right. And normally I get people to stand here for 30 seconds because this will slowly bring on their pain in that trochanteric or gluteal region and do the same on the other side. That's great. On your other side, we'll get you to do a weight bearing hip rotation. So this time I want you to balance on that left leg. Exactly. Turn to the, yep, exactly. So I say turn to the left as far as you can, turn to the right as far as you can. Is there any pain at all with that? So this is a, a test for a couple of things. It's the capsule length. It's a weight bearing grind for osteoarthritis of the hip joint. All right, so we're going to uh, do a little bit of a strength test now. Um, can I get you to walk on your tiptoes five steps in a row? Good. And no difference between the two sides when you do that. Same on your heels. Get those toes as high as you can. We're trying to see how high they come. Yep, that's really good. Um, and then back on your right foot can you give me three hops so this is a little bit of a test for gastroc but it's also a test for that femoral neck stress fracture so people with a 
femoral neck stress fracture can't hop or they have pain when they land they often hop with their eyebrows so as they try to get up they're jerking their eyebrows up the last thing is just marching on the spot knees up to waist height so i want you to get those knees up high five steps on each side so we're trying to just fatigue those hip flexors a little bit no difference between the two sides great stuff grab a seat facing the camera for me because now we're going to carry on and test them a little bit more so with you sitting there I just want you to put both hands on your right knee and then lift up as hard as you can with your knee and push down so both hands on one leg hard as you can and then stop that and do it on the other side is there any difference in your strength when you do that nope and then straighten your leg out that right leg and do the same thing with your leg straight this is going to hurt a little bit if your hammies are tight no up on your knee there yep it doesn't really matter we're just trying to put it in a position of dis discomfort here and the same on the other side and no problems doing that and then put your fists between your knees and try and hurt them squeeze them as hard as you can really try and hurt them any pain any difference between the two sides with that so that's an adductor stress test it's a synthesis stress test um, it's just challenging those structures in the groin nicely there all right so swing that chair away and i'm going to get you to lie on the floor side on to the camera so i just want you to um try just lifting your feet up off the ground for a start and holding them there both feet at the same time just a little bit up and hold them there and you get any discomfort doing that Nope, drop them down again. So this is a pelvic ring stress test. It doesn't declare whether it's a symphysis or a sacroiliac joint, but it is stress, it's the active straight leg raise pelvic ring stress test. And so it's one of those things you do to try and help decide, is it sacroiliac joint, is it lumbar or is it hip? Okay, this time with your right leg, I want you to pull your toes towards your head, keeping that knee straight, lift it up slowly until you start to feel it run out of rope. You're showing off now and down again. And just point your toes like a dancer and do the same thing with that uh, pointed and is there any difference in what you feel there there's not a big difference in what we see so that's pretty good you mind just doing your left side toes up first and lift that yeah that's pretty good and down again and point and do it again so not a lot of difference there so that's um braggard's sign is the ankle dorsiflexion creating increased nerve tension if there's a, a more than 10 degree difference there, then you've got some adverse nerve tension, which adds to problems like recurrent hamstring injuries or um, hamstring origin issues. Okay. Um, so now we're going to test that hip joint. So what I want you to do is take your right knee in both hands and take it to your right shoulder and pull it up as far as you can. Is there any discomfort with that? So this is Dremen sign inline flexion. If they have pain or they have to bring the knee up to the side, then they've got a retroverted acetabulum or femoroacetabular impingement. Can you take that right knee towards your left shoulder now? So now we're coming into quadrant. Good. I want you to reach down with your left hand and grab your ankle and pull it across your body even further. And now we're stretching the gluteal muscles piriformis. Is there any pain with that? A little bit of discomfort there. Now I want you to swap hands. So your right hand goes down to your ankle and your left hand's at your knee. And I want you to pull them in opposite directions. So bring that ankle away from your midline. That's really good. So this is your impingement quadrant internal rotation. That's great. Now take your knee back so it's pointing straight at the roof. So it's, that's perfect. And now I just want you to try and stretch your butt by taking your knee straight across your body that way. So this is a Dremens, not Dremens, it's a horizontal adduction stress test. Is there any pain with that? No, that's great. And bring it, bring it back and drop your foot down. And put your feet together, bend your knees up halfway, uh, feet on the floor for me, sorry, and drop your knees apart as wide as you can go into that butterfly stretch position. So what we're looking at here is in any difference in height of those knees, uh, is there any increase in lumbar lordosis, which suggests an anterior capsular tightness as he does that, and obviously if there's any pain, is there any pain with that, Mark? And again, this is gonna stress your sacroiliac joint as well, so if there was pain, you'd wanna know whereabouts that pain was. All right. So, last thing, lying on your side facing me, we're gonna just relax with those hips and knees slightly bent. I want you to use your left hand to just feel the muscles of your hip and just probe around in there and tell me if there are any tender spots. Is it tender on the bone? Is it tender behind the bone or above the bone? Is there anything in there that reproduces your pain? 
So this is one of the tests that those guys from Duke University said was actually quite useful. It was reliable and reproducible. The other test that they suggested was one you do sitting. So, I'll, sorry, Mark, I'll get you to grab that chair one more time. This is, I find this a, a little bit of a challenging one, but we'll see how we go. I haven't had Mark do this. So basically what I want you to do, Mark, and we'll do your right leg first, is I just want you to lift your foot a little bit off the floor. So just a centimeter off the floor. And I want you to take your foot away from your other foot. So you're turning your thigh towards your other knee, but taking your foot away. Yeah, that's right. As far as you can go and hold it for five seconds. So that's what they've described. So that's your internal rotation. And now I want you to put that foot on the floor and do the same with your left leg. And so slightly less to me on the left than the right, but reasonably good. Yep. And now this time I want you to go the other way. So with your right foot just off the floor and take it across the front of your shin as far as you can go. So that looks 30 degrees, maybe a little more. And the same on your left. And again, as I say, these guys, and that looks the same to me, these guys described the patient holding it for five seconds. Brilliant. So that's it. That's that's what I do with my patients. Um, sometimes you have to walk around the house a little bit to find a room where they can lie on the floor. Um, but that's easier with a phone than with a laptop, obviously. Um, so let's get back into the talk here. I just have to share my screen again. So I think it would be fair to say that um, that type of examination works a lot better if the patient is prepped in advance. So I think making sure that they understand what you're about to do in, in advance of the appointment is, uh, is very helpful in terms of getting some compliance. So bearing that in mind when you're booking the appointment is, uh, is quite worthwhile. Definitely. A little bit of communication that they're going to need a bit of space and that they should wear clothes that they're happy to be examined in, that you're going to want to see their waist in particular and ideally their back. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, so that takes us through to imaging. And obviously we're in level four lockdown at the moment, but we can still get x-rays, uh, which is not a big deal. So it's worth getting x-rays in someone where you're concerned about their problem. So if they've just presented, it's their first presentation, there's a good story for a strain or a sprain and it's not a big worry and range of motion is well maintained and there's nothing big and bad, you don't need x-rays. Give them a trial of therapy and if they get better, they never needed x-rays because basically you can see from this big white blob in the middle here, x-rays involve radiation and these screens don't really work that well. Um, if you're going to get x-rays, you want to get a weight-bearing AP and I prefer the weight-bearing AP um, because it closes up gaps in the adults that, that might rest open when they're lying down. So if you've got osteoarthritis, it can look way worse if you're standing. So for me, I just make it a rule, a weight-bearing AP. And then if they're young, a frog leg lateral is the easiest way to look for a slip femoral epiphysis. So young people get AP and uh, frog leg lateral. For adults where we're more interested in whether they've developed a CAM, then the bilateral done views is, is better. And I always get bilateral because Sometimes patients have the same problem on the other side and you can say, hey, you've got this. Look, that's that's interesting. That's what's going on. Um, it's not a big deal. Your other side doesn't bother you. So we've got a good chance of getting you to settle down. Mark's um, given me these x-rays. This is an interesting one. This is an anterior inferior iliac spinae avulsion over here in a kid with really open iliac crest growth plates and a traction apophysitis of the hamstring on the opposite side here. So you can see how fluffy that is compared to that side, there's little, lots of little reasons for doing these kind of x-rays. Ultrasound is another useful tool. And um, the thing about ultrasound is that it does involve people getting real close to each other. And so we're trying to steer people away from it. During level four, there has to be a really serious reason for doing it. Um, but so if possible, we don't do it. Ultrasounds aren't great for looking at the Articular structures of the joint they are really good for looking at the tendons, the adductors, the gluteal tendons, trochanteric bursitis, um, hamstring origins, uh, and you might see fluid and a joint and a fusion. And an effusion is a sign that there's something going on in that joint. There shouldn't be fluid in a hip, so there's inflammation, possibly infection. Although normally that's you know you're not seeing someone following up an ultrasound when they've had an infection uh, or a cartilage injury of some description. MRIs show us everything we want, really. They show us ligaments, they show us muscles, they show us tendons, um, injuries. Uh, muscles are good here, blood products and all sorts of things. In the hip, they show labral tears, injuries to ligamentum teres, bone stress. We get an idea about articular cartilage. They're not perfect for that. 
but we do get a, a lot of information with MRI and it is really easy to get MRIs at the moment because not so many people are getting out and hurting themselves. So that's uh, something that is not too hard to get. I normally get an arthrogram with a long acting local anesthetic when I'm looking at a hip injury because labral tears occur in 70% of almost every population that's been studied. And so just because there's a tear on your MRI doesn't mean it's causing you pain. But if a patient walks out of an arthrogram and says, this is how I want to feel, uh, then I'm convinced that the intra-articular problem is the source of their pain. But obviously at the moment, I'm trying not to get people too close to each other. MRI is easy. You can wait in the car park, get called in, have your scan and leave. There's no one in the waiting room at the moment. It's all pretty safe and pretty separate. Um, so one thing I would just mention, I meant to, meant to say this before, is that you're trying to manage something that you would normally have got to meet the patient. You get a better gauge about their personality. Are they a reliable citizen? Um, th does this seem like the real deal or does something seem off? You have an examination that you can do and you've got a feel for it because you've done it a thousand times before and you're not getting that now. You haven't done this a thousand times before. You've got no feel for what's going on. So one piece of advice I would give you is if you think you might image or you wonder if you should, you should. If you think you might, you should. Just honestly, you're better off investigating because there's a part of your story that you don't have. You don't have the information you normally have. Where can you get more information from? Get, get some imaging, get an x-ray or get them to us and we'll get an MRI. But obviously, I, I'm not going to get MRIs until I've seen x-rays. I want to see that morphology. Again, the x-ray the shows us the shape of the cup. And if that's shallow, we're going to struggle no matter what. If that's deep, we're going to struggle a bit, maybe not as much. If there's a big bad cam, we're really going to struggle. If everything looks perfect, this guy's going to do fine. You know, we know 90% of labral tears get better without needing surgery. 70% of the population, population have them. So if the x-ray looks fine, get on with the conservative care. CT scanning is great for bony morphology. This is a cam here. Scintigraphy is great to see if, if there's any kind of reaction around the bone and the joint. A combination of the two CT specs is really sensitive and fun to look at and great to show patients. But they do involve getting front to face to face with people and, and injections of radiation. And then there are other injections, local anesthetic, cortisone, diagnostic injections that we can do as well. Again, not in level four. So my indications or reasons for imaging if someone's if, if you've got a young person and there's not a good history of injury then you really should be imaging them and if you've got a young person and there is a good history of injury then you should be injuring uh, imaging them so if someone's fallen off a jungle gym you probably need to get an x-ray anyone with any asymmetry of alignment that is new so someone who's always had one foot that turns out that's not new but if someone's normally been good and you're looking at them going does that foot always turn out 30 degrees like that and they're going no that's that's because of this problem they should be imaged so in the young people it can be a sufi classical sign of a sufi is a turned out foot In older patients it can be an in fact impacted femoral neck stress fracture sorry femoral neck fracture where the bone sort of the head sits onto the neck but it sits in a slightly different shape and changes the alignment of that limb um, and then a gradual onset of hip pain in a runner is going to probably be a stress fracture like this. This is a compressive sided one. You can get them on this side where they pull apart and they are bad. So we send these ones to hospital and we get these guys to rest. Um, if someone's got really severe pain in a hip that's had off arthritis and it just isn't making sense for the degree of wear and tear you see, they could have AVN. So I'm more likely to get an MRI of them. Uh, people over 60 as a rule are going to get an x-ray because they're in a group where the incidence of metastases or primary bone tumors is starting to go up again and red flags are just someone who can't wait bear that's a red flag regardless of age unrelenting night pain as i mentioned before or pain that's not load related significant pain that's not load related fevers and sweats lymph nodes up feeling unwell off your food this is probably an infection until proven otherwise and as I mentioned before, any past history of cancer would be a red flag for me and I'd be imaging that further. So that just brings us to a brief little chat about treatment. And I always talk to people about my treatment pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid are the physical things, uh, topical gels like deep heat, tiger balm, counter irritants, orals, you know, a well-balanced diet, turmeric, um, and then if they need it, Panadol and anti-inflammatories, the injectable and technical. So you can use cortisone for some things. Uh, I try not to use it if I can avoid it. Shockwave is really good for trochanteric pain, gluteal tendinopathy. 
uh, and right at the top of the pyramid. If we can save you from it, we will, but it is surgery up there. So I've got a couple of little things uh, on the right here and they're hidden under my photo. So I'm just gonna slide my photos away from that. You can probably do the same if I'm in your way. But young people who have open growth plates, they don't need strengthening uh, in a big way. So this is a common thing that I see as a patient who's been sent in with a, a problem to do with a, one of the growth plates around the hip and they've been told they need to be strengthening those muscles. So they need to be doing gluteal exercises when they've got a, a tendinopathy and they've got an, a hamstring origin problem and they're doing hamstring strengthening. They've got an apophysitis, it's injured because it's overloaded. What the apophysis needs is it needs rest. The strengthening you should be doing is for other things like the core or the other muscles away from that area, but you want to relatively rest the overloaded area, the injured area. So load reduction, look at your muscle balance, get your core stability sorted out, and don't forget the nerves get left behind just like everything else. We only have growth plates in the bone, we don't have growth plates in the muscle, we don't have growth plates in the nerves. So when those limbs get longer, these are the things that get left behind. Chris. Young adults, competitive in sport. I love the Holmic protocol. It's got a start, it's got an end, and people buy into it and they work hard at it and they see gains. And it doesn't have to be just for symphysitis and adductor problems. I reckon any hip problem gets better in this group with Holmic unless they've got a significant femoroacetabular impingement. And then, then we are going to need to deal with that as well as we can. But even then, I still would try the Holmic first. There's a good set of exercises. The research is on adults with FAI syndrome, and that's that UK fashion hip exercise thing. This is a set of exercises that are designed to be individually tailored to each patient. So you can find them online really easily. I think we'll post a link to that uh, on Facebook later on, but that's a really good uh, asset. Uh, trochanteric pain, my favorite exercise is the isometric hip hitch. So these people are normally older and they haven't done any real exercise for a long time. And if you get MRIs of their hips, you'll be surprised at how much fat atrophy they have in their gluteal muscles. So get them hands on hips, lift that opposite hip and hold it for 40 seconds if they can, 30 to 40 seconds, 45 seconds, five times a day. All you're doing is you're generating tension. When you get them to do a repeated hip lift where you're dropping, you're actually creating compression at the bottom of that drop. And that there is some evidence that that causes metaplasia of the tina sites and causes them to make fibrocartilage. So getting them to do an isometric hitch where there's much more tension and much less compression when the opposite hip is higher is better for stimulating cells to grow good tendon. And then the last set of exercises, and uh, Emma Latty put me onto these, are the GLAD or the Nemex TJR protocols. So GLAD, G-L-A stands for Good Living with Arthritis from Denmark and Nemex is neuromuscular exercises for patients requiring total joint replacement. So that was research done in uh, patients requiring hip and knee osteoarthritis and they showed a 30% reduction in pain just through doing these exercises. So in those older patients who are struggling with OA but aren't bad enough to need surgery, it's really good to get them into a program like that. So that's it. A quick tour of my life uh, with hips online. Um, it's a great opportunity now to have some questions and answers. Now, good idea. Do you want to stop sharing your screen there, Chris? Um, oh, that's a good idea. Just while, uh, while you're doing that. So there's a couple of questions here already. So one is around um, if a patient's got largely positive te Bragard's test, so they've got some neural tension, what are some of your favorite exercises or tips to reduce neural tension? So I love, I love nerves and nerve tension. And the big lesson for me over the last sort of 20 odd years is that you don't have to hurt a patient to help a patient. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of the excursioners these days. I almost never, never need tensioners. So I like um, a glider and excursioner where the head and the foot move together. So I'm a head down, foot down, head up, foot up guy cycling between those two positions. I get people to floss before they do stretches. So I like them to say, hey, the nerve's gonna get, there's stuff happening, do you wanna come with me? Let's do some of this. So I'd just get them to cycle through that five times in a row and then go stretch their hamstring or then go stretch the piriformis. Um, normally there's something else adding to that nerve tension if they've stopped growing, that is. So if they haven't stopped growing, if they're still growing, I get them to floss five times and then do a 30 second lying hamstring stretch where they're activating quads to stretch the hamstrings uh, and if mum or dad are around for one or two of those a day, just adding in four or five pounds of pressure, helping them straighten that leg out, makes a massive difference to nerve tension. So growing kids do really well. 
if you've stopped growing, you've got to look for the other things. So what's what, what's your back lumbordosis like, gluteal muscles like? Have you got the trigger points in the piriformis muscle? So there's a progression that I use for helping people with telehealth. I've had to get into this. I didn't do this before. I had physios who helped me with these things. In fact, physios make me look good because they fix these problems and patients think that it's my, my uh, influence. But really... All I'm doing is giving them the confidence that they're heading in the right direction. So the progression for me is to take a ball of some kind. Tennis balls are normally fine when you start, put it against the wall, lean your butt on it and try and find that sore spot. If that's not working, then you can put it on a seat and sit on it. And in a seated position, the muscles are pulled a little tight. So you don't get quite as deep in with the ball. And then if you're thinking that's that's good, better than the wall, but not good enough, you get on the floor and now you've put your whole body weight on it with the leg, the muscles in a relaxed position. So you'll penetrate deeper into the gluteal muscles on the floor. And then you go to a hard ball like a cricket, hockey or lacrosse ball uh, if you're wanting a little bit more. And if you've got someone who's got a strong elbow at home who you can bribe with chocolate cake or something, uh, then you might get someone else to do some, some work for you. But I really like patients doing that themselves because they can push push it as hard as they feel they need to. The other thing is I do get them to, to floss five times a day. I get them to floss if they sit, if they have a seated job, I get them to floss every hour. Um, if they're gonna go for a walk or go for a run or get on the bike or do some weights or do anything, I like them to floss before they do that. So they've set the scene that the nerve, there's some stuff gonna happen. I want you to come with me. Are you with me here? Let's go and then they get into it. So the risk of having problems with it is less, but floss, then stretch and maintain your strength. So whatever you're stretching, there's a relationship between length and strength. So if they're tight, then stretching is fine. If they're normal, then overstretching runs the risk of creating functional weakness and disharmony in that kinetic chain. So if you're trying to reduce nerve tension and adding the flexibility of the nerve, you've got to maintain the strength of that muscle if their length is normal. Um, and I guess a good point to make there is... Uh, a problem shared is a problem halved in that setting. So um, you know, I guess in a telehealth environment, that's a, a really easy consultation potentially to have uh, and demonstrate a lot of those those exercises for, for the therapists out there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and that's, uh, and I, for me, it's just so good to have guys I know, that, you know, everyone who's sort of contacted me to say, hey, we're still going, how are you guys going? That's great for me because it means I know you, you're you over there and they're over there and there's someone that I can put these guys in touch with. I mean, we're seeing more non-referred patients these days as well, so it lets us be a little more flexible with those ones. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something that is way better. It's way more better use of my time if I've got someone that I can have. I know that someone's going to be watching them and pushing them along and encouraging them and, uh, yeah, educating them. Yeah. Here's a question from Kate. Um, what's your view on trochanteric bursitis diagnosis uh, and regarding injecting the bursa? Okay. So my view is that um, a true trochanteric bursitis that is de novo and associated with florid inflammation is extremely rare, in my opinion, and I would be thinking about rheumatoid arthritis or seronegative spondyloarthropathy if they had a florid bursitis. Uh, but bursitis is common in people with tendonitis or poor function, uh, so it's not a true inflammatory problem, it's a reactive problem, and so treating the bursitis is not helping those people get better. So for me, I'd be trying to encourage them to generate tension in that muscle, starting you know, with the old fashioned basics, just isometrics first. Can you do that? Can you hold it? How long can you hold it for? Let's do that. You know, one of the things about isometrics is that every second you're holding that muscle under contraction, the nerves which are releasing neurotransmitters into the muscle end plates are also releasing neurotrophic hormones. So even though they might not feel like they're doing much, they're creating an anabolic environment in that region that's going to stimulate repair. So isometrics are really useful and really important. Uh, I don't. Um, it's very rare to inject a trochanteric bursa. Obviously, if it's if it's a real florid thing and there's a raised ESR and there's no sign of infection, then that would be reasonable to do. But one of my little pointers here is get an ultrasound, and if it shows there's a significant tendinopathy or a large intrasubstance tear, don't put cortisone near it. Okay because they're already hanging on by the skin of their teeth and you're going to weaken it even further. Even if you're not weakening it, you're going to create an environment where they're able to put more load through it without the normal restrictions 
And even if it's got nothing to do with the cortisone, people do rupture their gluteal tendons and they, they can happen spontaneously, but you'll be the one who gets the blame because you stuck the cortisone in a week before and it was the cortisone that rotted that tendon. Honestly, these, these things happen. People rupture their tendons without cortisone, but if you're the one who put the cortisone before it happened, you'll be, you'll be responsible for it. So I'm not a big fan. Cortisone actually stops the production of collagen for a period of time. It makes it very hard to remodel. It interferes with the conversion of DNA to mRNA. It's a stress hormone. It's designed to help us survive attacks, but we're supposed to walk away from that saber-toothed tiger and lick our wounds and have some recovery time. And cortisone lets people dodge that bullet, which I don't think is useful. Do you know, literally, I just typed, um, there was a no saber tooth tiger comment in the comments, and I said there was still time, and there it was. So yeah. hopefully Coleman hung on for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, a question uh, from Human, who said, keen runners and cyclists um, in the peak of their powers in their 40s um, with FAI, do you let them keep doing those activities, um, but tell them to stop when you experience pain, um, particularly when you know that they won't? Uh, hey, Human. Good to hear from you. Um, so my, uh, my sort of advice to this is, I, I talk to them about three different types of pain. I tell them there are four different types of pain, but if we're having to talk about type four pain, we need a sports psychologist to be involved as well. So type one pain is that when you get up in the morning, you can feel that you did something yesterday, but it warms up completely when you get warmed up and it doesn't come back afterwards. If you've got type one pain, that's a sign there's still remodeling going on, but you're doing fine. Keep doing what you're doing and you can build up uh, no more than 10% per week. And 10% is, don't forget, increasing intensity is worse than increasing duration. So get your duration up first before you start adding in and don't change duration and intensity at the same time. Type two pain is where, when you exercise, you're sore, but it warms up and you feel absolutely fine while you're moving, while you're doing stuff. But as you cool down, it gets sore or you sit around later in the day, it's sore. Um, that's a sign that in the last four days, you've pushed it too much. The balance between things that are helping and things that are hurting is out of balance. And you need to take a good hard look at yourself and what you've been doing and try and sort that balance out in the next four days. So you might not run two runs. You might drop two of your runs and get in the pool instead, or you might get on a bike or you might get some active recovery, get a massage. Um, you've got to look at your quality of sleep. I know Mark's burning both ends of the candle at the moment. If he started to get some niggles, I'd be telling him, just give me some work, mate. Take it a bit easier, but he's uh, working too hard. So those are real important things. What's your nutrition been like? Have you been maintaining your hydration? Have you been sitting still for too long? Look at your last four days, plan your next four days, and respect your body. I can't help a patient who won't listen to their body. So if you want to fix this hip, you need to show it some respect because we're not going to win it by beating it to death. Type 3 pain is what we call pull the pin pain or ceiling pain. So the thing about type 3 pain is you're slowly getting better, and then you go out for a run, maybe it's a little sore at the start, so you think, oh, this is type two pain, it's warmed up completely, I'm fine. But after five minutes or five Ks or whatever, it starts to hurt and it gets worse with every step, that's type three pain. So up to that point, you were still waking it up, but from the time you notice that pain, you've already done some damage. And even if you stop straight away, that's gonna take two or three days just to recover from what you've just done. So if you do that run again, three days later, you're back here again, and if you do it again three days later, you're back here again. So you can see over the space of two weeks, you've made no net gain. So you can't have type three pain more than once a week if you want to get better. The good thing about type three pain is if you run and you get it and you work out exactly how many minutes or how many Ks it was, write it down. Stay under that ceiling for seven days. So you might want to run five Ks a day, but you might run two Ks in the morning and two Ks at night. And because your five Ks is your ceiling, you're getting four Ks done in the day. You've never pushed it to a point where it's fatigued or it's hurting. No problem, seven days later, if you want, run until it hurts. And you should be better than 10% better than you were last time. And if you are, you're getting better. Stick to the rules, you're gonna be fine. If you're no better, you're missing something. Your body's not healing, you've got a bigger deal going on, it's more than what you think it is. You need to get back and, and work out what's going on. So type three pain, you just can't make gains if you're having it more than once a week. Type four pain doesn't warm up, it hurts with every step, it gets worse through the run. Mate, you've got a psychological issue that needs to be sorted out. Um, try and back off on the workload if you can. Improve your work-life balance. See a good nutritionist because they help people's brains more than a lot of other things do. You know, you need some help if it's type 4 pain. Does that help? I think so. A so, um, couple of other things. So how would you unload an athlete with a neck femur stress fracture and do you image before return to run or symptom-based progression? 
So there's two kinds of femoral neck stress fractures. There's the compressive side and there's the tension side. Tension fractures pull apart and they really don't tolerate load at all. So they will go into hospital and they'll often have a screw fixation or a dynamic screw and plate. Uh, and then they mobilize post-surgically and we just go through the normal post-op recovery and then we get them running again using a graduated progression of load. The compressive side of ones are safer and we can manage them better, but, it, but basically the rule is they can't have pain. So if they're limping because they're sore, they need to be on crutches. So they can't, they can't get better if they're having pain every day. Every time they create pain in their hip, they've broken a few of the spot welds and they've set themselves back. So they've lost that day's healing. Um, so they've got to start putting days back to back where there's been no pain at all. And if that means crutches for a week, that's what it means. Maybe sometimes it's two, but often it's no more than that. Normally, if they're on crutches, they're not exercising. That's my rule. If you can't walk around the house without pain, that's it. Just give it time. Let it chill. We'll get you there. But at the moment, you need rest more than you need load. Our body needs load and recovery to make gains. You've had too much load. Now you need too much recovery. And then we'll start to get back into that climb again. Once I've been pain-free, normally for three or four weeks, I'll see them in the clinic and I'll get them to hop three times as high as they can. And if they have no pain on the triple hop test, then they're about halfway through the healing process. So the bone's probably 60% healed. That means someone's taken a hacksaw and sawed 40% of the way through. But that's what we call clinical healing. That's what we accept when someone breaks their arm. We know it hasn't finished healing, but it's strong enough to come out of a cast. And so when they can do a triple hop test without pain, they're ready to start walking. They're not for fitness, that is. They're not ready to start walking for fitness before that, but from that point on, they can walk. They can walk for 15 minutes, and that's not going to give them any exercise, really, but it's going to start loading the bone up. They want to do that walking in the shoes that they want to be running in. Uh, they want to be doing that walking on the surface they want to be running on. So the problem with our body is it wants to give you what you want. So if you say to it, I want to run on concrete, it'll go, okay, hell, how, how am I going to cope with that? Okay, I'm going to make bone that will absorb that shockwave pattern, and then we'll be fine. And if you go, oh, yeah, yeah, concrete for four days, but I'm going to run on grass now and take it easy. Shh, don't do that because the bone's got no idea. What, what are we do? Are we running on concrete? No, you see, we're not running on concrete. We're running on grass. Oh, shit, get rid of this stuff and let's get some of that grass stuff in, stuff that can cope with a longer shock wave uh, that's not as high. Okay, okay, well, let's do that. No, find out what you want. Stick to it. Let your body get used to it. You can get fancy later. And then just, I just build them up using my walk jog program. Once they get to jogging, I like them only jogging for 30 seconds at a time. I want them to be concentrating on perfect form and your brain can't concentrate on a mechanical task for more than 30 seconds at a time. So the jogging is 30 seconds until you're running perfectly every 30 seconds and pain-free, no fatigue, let the muscles be the shock absorbers and then progress into continuous jogging. And only once you've got your jogging duration up, can you start to add intensity, which is your intervals and your time trials and hills and things like that. I got a little distracted there, but cross training in the pool is real important. You're right in the flow. I didn't want to uh, interrupt. So there's a few more questions here. I'm conscious that we're kind of getting on with time. So um, if you are out there listening and uh, you want to log off, fill your boots, but we will try and get through what you've got here. So um, from Sarah, um, with the prevalence of labral tears, uh, how long do you suggest patients attempt rehab before they consider surgical intervention? Um, for example, would, would you have them try a cortisone injection? Yep, so I would, I would tell people six months of real good hard work on you know, concentric strengthening uh, for the muscles around the hip and those neuromuscular exercises before you even think about having surgery unless you've got a shallow cup or a big cam or retroversion if you've got a mechanical reason that you're not going to get better you're just kind of wasting time it's worth trying but if you've got normal morphology and an abnormal labrum on an mri you really want to hammer the rehab for a good six months and then if you're thinking maybe you'll try a cortisone you might try a cortisone in that setting just to see how good you can make it because it's the last shot before you talk to a surgeon yeah, and I saw a question along a similar line. I treat a professional MMA fighter with FAI. It requires weekly treatment despite being conscientious with exercises. Would you look at surgery as an option prior to retiring from sport or continue to maintain? The problem is that surgery is, is very poor in terms of guaranteed outcomes uh, with these problems. And so I've seen too many athletes' careers ended by labral surgery, and I've got you know, patients whose lives have been uh, really 
compromised by the pain they're left with after the surgery. So I'm not a fan of, of using surgery as a solution. But as I say, if there's a mechanical reason that you're never going to get better, you may be better off addressing that. So if he's got a big cam, he might be better off getting rid of the cam. And it's like pushing the reset button on your computer, you know, clear the memory and get on with it. Um, but if it was my hip, I would be doing the rehab and doing the maintenance stuff and, and keeping on going. What you, so I guess the, the one thing to point out is that the evidence for that is, is the best if you're a young guy with a big cam. So yep. if you're going to have a, an athlete have surgery, um, potentially that's the guy, assuming that he's young, he's got normal articular cartilage and a big cam. Um, it probably won't give him a normal hip, but uh, it's going to be the best chance. So probably worth considering before retirement, would you say, Chris? Definitely. Like, like Mark said, and like I said before, if you've got a cam, you're just pushing it uphill and you're not going to beat a cam into submission. It's Every time it comes up, it grinds into the articular cartilage. And once you've got a rim lesion, the prognosis is poor. So a rim lesion is where the articular cartilage is starting to delaminate because of that impaction. Get rid of the cam and start again. Yep. Good, good point here from Sarah Beeble. Um, thanks for the, uh, the shout out, Sarah. So, um, just making a point with the, the athlete with the stress fracture to making sure that you're considering their energy balance and uh, that whole concept of red S and whether that might have been something that uh, that has predisposed them to having hip fracture. So just a um, good point from Sarah. And if you've got any patients that are having trouble with energy deficit, um, she, uh, she loves that problem, which uh, is great because I'm not very good at it. Um, the okay, a 94 year old post total hip joint replacement. So, um, that sounds like a great case. Yeah, um, I'm being serious because uh, I think yeah. the patients are, are real fun. Love um, them. Second fall MRI shows ruptured glute medi medius tendon and glute max tendon. She wants to know whether she should get it fixed. COVID put the brakes and everything anyway. Uh, look, that's a that's a toughie. A lot of patients will find a way of managing around it, but there's so many things to add up in that case 94 she sounds like she's a good turkey if she's thinking about having an operation that's right i'd be working on the strength you know i i've seen some amazing things from patients getting other muscles to do jobs and you you can't understand how they can do it but i would be counseling her to work on making everything else work as well as it can before she thinks about that um, there's a talk that you maybe should be on Tiger King. Um, Chris, I don't know if you spent any time on Netflix uh, during the lockdown, but uh, you maybe should have a look at that. Maybe I'll have um, a look at that. That's from Catherine Porteous, uh, Royce. Um, so um, we've got a couple more, I think. So um, do you see a lot more label tears now compared to 20 years ago? Um, and if so, is it due to better imaging or more sedentary people? Uh, no. I don't see more. I um, probably see slightly less now or care less about them. So 20 years ago, I came out of Melbourne, which was the hotbed of hip arthroscopy. And I was struggling to get imaging that was the quality I wanted when I got back here. But um, I, I, yeah, I, I, way more aggressive with conservative care these days. And so it worries me less when I see it. Yeah. Uh, a question from Darren. Um, I've got a 45 year old female runner with lateral hip pain just below the iliac crest. Um, all subjective and symptoms would suggest tendon type problem. However, it's just below the iliac crest rather than the trochanteric region. So maybe TFL. Um, any tips for management of that problem? Yeah, that's real frustrating. So if it is sort of pushed upwards onto that edge and it's and she's tried strengthening the hip abductors and her running gait's okay and you've had a look at that by a podiatrist, so immediately posted orthotic will sometimes take some pressure off the outside of the hip shockwave works really well for those uh, iliac crest problems i reckon so you've got a it's my fourth level of the pyramid if you haven't done the basics the physical stuff which i'm sure you have uh then you're, you're sort of but if you've tried that and she's tried everything and she's frustrated and, and not getting it and not making progress then that's what i would do in those iliac crest problems cool so um okay uh can you comment on rehab and return to running post micro fracture for uh, chondral injuries is microfracturing being performed very often in Auckland now um, yep so microfracture is something that we do in desperation to try and stimulate an environment of repair for cartilage cells and it's done by some surgeons uh, some surgeons who do it 
have got a little bit of a conflict because they're saying on one hand that cartilage doesn't repair, so you need to do a microfracture. And then on the other hand, they're saying, well, we're doing the microfracture to create an environment for the cartilage to repair. So I'm still very cautious about it. And I'm very cautious with the way I talk to my patients about it as well. The thing that you've got is you've got articular cartilage damage. So you have got osteoarthritis that you're dealing with. That's what you're dealing with. And so there's no reason for them not to be able to run, but they shouldn't have running as their primary and only form of exercise. They should have running as a way of maintaining sanity and bone density, uh, but they should be looking at maintaining fitness in other ways, rollerblading, biking, swimming, so that they've got a way of resting those tissues, but still maintaining their fitness and keeping that competitive juices flowing. Um, with microfracture, I am keen for patients to start out with their getting their fitness back aqua jogging and using a bike as a form of nourishment for the joints. As they tolerate more load on the bike, they can build what they do on the bike up. They can start adding in seated intervals. And if they can do seated intervals and they manage their life without pain, then they can get into standing intervals. If they can do standing intervals, then they can start to add in walking through the walk jog program. Uh, and they might get they might decrease load initially on the bike, but normally they'll keep their fitness up on the bike as the walking becomes a workout. Once they start to get some weight bearing exercise, then they can drop the intensity on the bike. And once they're running, then they still need the bike. They need that bike, in my opinion, every day as a form of active recovery for that joint. That joint is not normal. It will never be normal. It needs to be respected as such and rest won't fix it, but abuse will break it down. And taking drugs that allow you to abuse it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So surgeons who do joint replacements often tell their patients, just take pain relief until you can't handle it anymore and then we'll do a hip joint replacement. Yeah, that's what's gonna happen. So if your patient doesn't want a joint replacement and wants to respect this, then they need to understand this is not a normal joint and it needs to be loaded in a controlled but progressive manner. Look, I, I might, we'll call this our last question, but um, what's your go-to treatment for a snapping hip syndrome? That's a... Yep, so there's two kinds of snapping hip, internal snapping hip, external snapping hip. The external snapping hip is the one where the kids come in, they go, look, I can do this, it pops backwards and forwards. They just need to be told that's absolutely normal for a flexible child who's growing. Focus on your strength and stop doing that to your hip because it becomes a habit and you don't need to do that. There's no nothing to be gained. It's not doing any harm, but just don't do it. The internal snapping hip is a little bit trickier and often there's some issue like tightness of the psoas or there could be back pain. These things all interact. So if there's a back problem and the psoas is splinting the back, it tightens up and that can cause a snap. So fix the back. Uh, if the gluteal muscles are too short, it can stop that hip from sitting in a better position for psoas to track properly. So stretching up the gluteal muscles is sometimes the solution. Very, very rarely people have a weird anatomical variation of bifid psoas, which snaps backwards and forwards because it's got two heads and, and once in a blue moon, that might need a little operation, but that's super rare. If there's genuine locking, it could be ligamentum teres or a labral tear. You might need to do something about that. I'm just going to ask you one more, just the one more, because it's quite a good question from uh, Pamela Rivers. Um, do you find that patellofemoral pain and FAI are often co-occurring? So, you know, there's a Hippocratic rule that says the primary pain masks the secondary. So patients don't come in and say, I've got hip pain and patellofemoral pain but 20% of primary hip pain presents as knee pain. So it is common to have knee pain with hip pain. And internal rotation of the hip aggravates uh, impingement, FAI, and it aggravates patellofemoral pain. So both can be caused by the same underlying mechanisms and addressing either of them appropriately can often improve the other one. But I think that's a very real thing. So look, guys, um, thanks very much for logging on and especially to your hearty souls that have stayed all the way to the end. So uh, just a reminder that we'll put, um, we'll put this on Facebook, uh, uh, Access Facebook page tomorrow and um, we'll probably clip out the, the examination part so that you can uh, easily find that. Um, not that that's something that I'll be particularly looking forward to viewing. Um, then uh, it looks like the clear, the clear favorite for next week is the shoulder. So um, we'll push on with that, I think. Um, so unless we're having trouble, we'll be doing the shoulder at this time next week. 
Um, and then there were quite a few papers that we talked about. So I'll try and get them out on our Twitter account this evening for those of you that are interested in Twitter. Um, but I guess for those of you who uh, aren't, <laughs> we'll put them on the Facebook page tomorrow. And, and it, we just made a, a super simple infographic, just kind of summarizing Chris's uh, exam for the hip in, in bullet points. Um, so look out for that as well. So that, that could be helpful just as a, a cheat sheet for you to run through when you're examining these patients. So um, uh, the, the other thing I should have said earlier was just around um, if you next time you're putting your hand up, um, we probably aren't going to see that. Um, it's just too many people logged on. So if you want to ask questions, just the Q and A is the way to go. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for your time. Um, thanks for your expertise. And uh, yeah, we look forward to the next one. Thanks, Fulch. Thanks for having me. And thanks for turning up, guys. It's so nice to see all these names out there, people I know. I'm sorry I haven't been able to keep track of all the chats. It's a little distracting, but it's good to catch up with everyone. Cool. Um, and I tried to answer to everybody, but I've just been blown out with 65 new messages. So for those of you that haven't answered, uh, I hope you're all well. And uh, I think we'll call it a night. Stay safe out there and uh, look forward to seeing you somewhere, whether it's on Zoom or in the clinic somewhere in the near future. So look after Thanks. yourself, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Mike.